Hello again, uh, my name is Terry. To this week we're going to be talking about the Vim workflow. We're going to start with kind of an algorithm baseline, how the, to actually talk about Vim. We'll actually write a very simple program from a story that uh, Carla seems to like. And then we'll go through some troubleshooting tips, okay? If you all have any questions, don't hesitate to, to let me know, okay? So, when you first start programming, you're gonna go ahead and get this uh, piece of paper and then you're gonna panic and go, oh my gosh, how am I going to turn this into a program? We've all been there. Don't worry, settle yourself down, breathe. I always like telling people, breathing is important to coding. Just get mm. yourself in that mindset where you're calm and you're, you're gonna be able to bring out the next step create an algorithm. This is going to, so this is going to be for, for you to create milestones throughout your program. You're going to say, okay, I need to do this, this, and this. You combine all those steps together and now you have a working program. It also makes it so you don't get lost in the weeds. When you're deep into a program and you go, huh, how was this supposed to connect over here? Because now they're just wrong it'll save you some time to know where you've been and where you're going. Then you're just gonna simply need to get started. There is no way to make this any easier. You're gonna pretty much be hitting your head against bricks until either your head breaks or you get through the wall. I wish it was better, but that's kind of the secret to programming is you just have to get through it. It is difficult, but the, the other side is, is there. When you absolutely do get stuck, the wall is just too thick. You've, go you've Googled the problem and you just can't solve anything. You have a lot of places you can go. Carla's got her TAs. You've got all of these TAs uh, that are helping out for you. You've got other classmates. You've got Carla herself. You've got a lot of resources to say, hey, I've got a problem, please help. All of these do kind of coincide with start early because if you start an hour before the due date, it might not go as well as you would hope, okay? Also, I really wanna iterate, don't get lost in the weeds. You have this algorithm and you have all of these tools at your disposal to not get lost. The last thing you wanna do is spend hours and hours coding on a thing that has no bearing on your product, okay? You're gonna hear this thing called the minimum viable product. You need to focus on making a computer program that only does what is needed, nothing extra. Then once you get a minimum viable product, you can then focus on kind of the extra stuff. So the program actually looks right. It's uh, uh, documented very nicely. The Functionality is double checked to make sure everything is working. You do memory leaks, stuff like that. But first you need an actual program to make it work, okay? So you at least have something to turn in, okay? Does anybody have questions on these? Okay, so first we're gonna start with an algorithm. This is not code. This is not something you're gonna just transfer into a computer program. This is for you to do guideposts. It's okay to gloss over the sticky parts for now. So some really good ones are, I need to run a sort, so I'm going to sort stuff from A to B. Whether you use something as simple as a bubble sort or as complex as a quick sort, that's something you could implement later. Unless you really wanna do it now, but you could gloss over it now so it's a real quick one line, it's sorted, and then keep going. Focus on one step at a time. A computer can only do one thing at a time. So your code and your algorithm is going to focus on doing one thing at a time, okay? So keep that mindset. It, it, what is an algorithm is also a great place for variable names. You're going to come up with some very complex things and one of the things that you're going to want to keep in the back of your mind is what is a good variable name for this? 
so that at once it is abstract enough for you to use in several different situations, but at the same time, it's specific enough so when you see that variable, bang, I know what that is, okay? Know the input and output of functions. If I'm passing something to a specific function and it returns something else, you should keep track of that. So when you're doing those flow charts and stuff, you should keep track of what is getting sent to it and what is coming back, all right? And then do a definition of your class objects. So you know when you're looking at an object, you know that everything it is and everything it will be, okay? Um, kind of the same thing with like structs and stuff like that, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, any questions on this? Okay, so. What I want you to do, uh, is anybody not interested in using Vim at all? You're using Emacs or Eclipse? All right, perfect. So what I want you to do is, from your command prompt, type man vim. What is this is doing is bringing up a manual of what everything, of all that Vim can do. I want you to scroll down until you see these flags, little o, capital O, and P. Does everybody see kind of where that is? I'm going to bring up a terminal here so we can do that. Okay, so when you're coming up with a whole bunch of, of files, so you've got a .h file, if you've got a C, .cpp file, and you might even have more than one. Later on, your programmers will have multiple h files and multiple cpp files. So you can go ahead and make Vim open up all of those files, either stacked, up, one right up above each other, you could open them up side by side. So imagine you're uh, computing a function and you're asking for a specific prototype and you've got that prototype in your .h file. You can put them both side by side on your screen. It can come in very handy. Or you could have the function on this and then where you're actually calling it from main, you could actually have that on the other side. So it allows you to look at two pieces of code at the same time. Uh, later on, uh, I actually found that opening them up in separate tabs was very easy because uh, you're looking at the entire block of code on one full screen and then you can switch from place to place. Okay? How you do it depends entirely on how you want to implement this. Okay? Does anybody have questions on this? Okay. Okay, so now I want to talk about putting stuff in the background and foreground. When you background a process, you do this by hitting Control Z. When you do this, you are creating a swap file. Well, actually, as soon as you're creating something in Vim, you've got what's called a swap file. So, has anybody seen something where they saw like main.cpp.swap? Does that look familiar? Or maybe a dot .swo? When, you're, when you say vim main.cpp, you're creating a new file. In the background, it's creating this main.cpp.swap. Main and if you suddenly lose power, it's going to check and see if there's a swap file and say, this might be a newer version than what was saved. So this might be newer, this might have saved data that's really useful before we died. And it might be earlier than the main.cpp. Does that make sense? Yeah. So wait, is it when power goes out? It's always going to be there, so in case power goes out. So you know how Windows will, or uh, Word will actually save your thing incrementally? That's what this swap file is. On the other hand, if, if you don't 
actually save it, like go to File, Save, and save over it, and you lose power, you're not, you're not going back to that last save space. You're going to the last time Word saved it. And you'll get a prompt and says, hey, I see there's a, a, a newer version of our failed file. Do you want to look at it? You want to try to recover this? Vim will do the same thing. However, if you background the process and then you try to open this up again, you're going to get that warning because it's going to try to open this up and see there's a swap file and you're going, it's going to run into this error. Does that make sense? We're going to, we're going to go ahead and do that real quick just to show you what's happening. Okay. So it, from your terminal, it doesn't matter where, we're going to just type vim main.cpp. We're not actually going to program quite yet. But notice how I'm at a command prompt. And then I'm going to press and, hold, press and hold control and then touch Z. That brings me back to this. Notice this says stopped vim main.cpp. That process that I called here is not running right now. Uh, that's not as good as it is. If you do an ls hyphen a, you're going to see a dot main dot cpp. We're, we're, I'm not seeing it. Yeah, that right there. Thank you. So that, notice that this is a hidden file. It starts with a dot. That's why you had to do the hyphen A. So this is now tracking that this file is open and we're going to do stuff to it, okay? Now, if you try to do and open this up again, It's going to warn you. This is already here. What do you want to do? If this is an accident, you can just go ahead and quit out of this and go back. OK? But because I'm talking about backgrounding processes, I want you to remember that this is what's happening. Because one of the tricks that is going to happen when you background a process is you're going to go running back to here, and you're going to create a bunch of files because every time you open vim you're creating a new swap file and if you open the same file over and over again you can run into trouble so keep that in mind okay now to go back I'm gonna type FG it's foreground okay you can also type jobs and it'll list the jobs that are background so if I have several Vim things or several things that are backgrounded, it's going to have a number. So I can type FG1 for the first one or 2 for the next one, so on. OK? How did you get from the terminal back to the uh, main? F FG, like that. I mean, uh, how did you switch from the uh, uh, Vim to the terminal? Uh, Oh, Control Z. Oh, okay. The same thing. So Control Z will background the process, and then FG foregrounds the process. Okay. Okay. Does anybody have questions on that? Okay. I know I kind of went over it a lot, but that is very important on how to do that. Okay. So I'm going to do a really quick example while we, we step through code, OK? Does something like this look familiar than what Carla would give you? Just a real quick, here's a story. I want you to program this. Does that seem familiar to anybody? OK, later on you'll look at this. But what I want you to do when you get these things is look at it kind of like this. What is flavor text? What is important? And what? you're going to do, OK? So we're going to look at a set of variables. 
we are going to be asking for boxes. We're going to look and we're going to put creepy dolls, exploding pop rocks, and some sticky slime, and they're each going to have their own box. We're then going to add them all together and put them in the boxes. And then we're going to output the value, and then we're going to say boo. OK? So what's the first step after getting this? We're going to write an algorithm. OK. So what are the variable names we want to do? OK, so boxes. What type is boxes? OK. What's the second one? I'm just going to type CD. One of the other things is, this is also where you're going to start out, where you can either do a, a snake case, where you would type something like this. Or camel case. Does anybody have a preference? All right, we'll go with camel case. OK, third variable. OK, we're just going to shorten that a little bit. We're just going to call it SS for now. OK. So we now have a list of variables that we're going to play with, and we have a type. So that when we go to code this, when we're trying to play around with what these are, we know exactly the type. That can save you a lot of time, so you know the difference between a string and an int, so you don't go ahead and try to free a string when you're thinking it's an int. OK? Stuff like that. So what's the first thing we're going to do? So we're going to, yeah, we're going to ask for some creepy dolls. We're going to just call it creepy right now. And then what's the next step? OK. We're going to ask for pop. And then what's the third step? OK. And what's, what are we going to do after this? We now have all three things. No, nope, we're not going to say boo yet. Oh. We're going to add them. So we're going to do boxes equals C plus P plus SS. OK? And then we're going to say boo. Well, we're going to output. Now, Put boxes. And then we're going to say boo. OK? Does this, does this kind of make sense? A nice logical flow of what we're about to do? OK. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this down. And now we're going to actually sit down and we're going to map that algorithm that we just did. To what we did. So what's the first line in our C++ program? Does anybody know it off the top of their head? Yeah. Say that again. OK, yes. So we're going to do a pound include. Oops. OK? Using namespace. Yep. Using name space. OK. And now what are we going to do? OK. So yeah, we can. Before we do that, though, let's declare our variable names, OK? So we're going to do int 
creepy dolls. Dolls. I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, how do you go up and down when you're in the insert mode? How do you? I used to be able to use the arrows, but when I'm no, you're going to have to escape and then go up and down. Really? Yeah. You are not going to have. So you c when you're programming, you can. You can use the arrows if you want. Uh, it's just when you're doing your, um, your demonstrations in front of Carla, you're not going to have access to the arrow keys. So you have to escape and then J or whatever. Yeah. I would, I would, I would highly recommend get into that um, just to get used to it. Later on, after Carla's classes, we can have a better talk of using the mouse, using the arrow keys, using uh, different blocks of Vim stuff. Yeah? I don't know why my cursor is, uh, I can do nothing and it doesn't buy it. Uh, are you in insert mode? Yeah. I was just working on it earlier and I can't do nothing. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, your computer has frozen. Oh. oh, try it, try it now. What just happened? Try clicking. Oops. Go ahead and close it and try to open it again. Actually, before we do that, let's try. No, you're just going to have to close it and open it again. Uh, try, try doing a another Vim thing and see what you can do. If that doesn't work, we'll we'll figure something out. Okay, so one of the things you're going to see me do is jumping directly to the end. So I want you to start getting used to quick ways to do that. Do you know what I did to? Oh, I was just going to ask another question. Yeah. Wait, how was it that you make a C++ program again? Main on CPP? Yeah. So it doesn't matter what you name it. Oh. It's just for your, for your knowledge base, put it in a .cpp. Linux does not care what the extension is called. That's kind of what Windows likes doing, and it's more for the humans. When you go to compile it, it's a lot easier for you to say star.cpp, and for everyone to know, oh, this is a CPP file. So imagine if uh, you write a CPP file for 163, you then write a C program for 201, and then you're in web security, so you're writing Python. It could get weird. However, there's a little bit of trickery going on in saying, oh, well, that's a Python because it's ending with .py. That's a C++ program because it's ending in C++. And that's a C program because it says .c. It's just some stuff you can play around with. Uh, can I ask you one question? Yeah. Uh, for some reason, my. Uh To the right of zero in your last yeah, line. It'll only be on the zero, and I'm trying to get to the right of it to insert a semicolon. Are you in insert mode? Yeah. Well, I exited out of insert mode. Oh, that's because you're not in insert mode. Now you can put stuff in. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm trying to get to the right of it, and I can only get to the. This is as far as it'll let me go. Oh, you want to put something to the right of the zero. Yeah. So that's when you do a shift A. Shift, shift A. Yeah. Oh, OK. Cool, thank you. Well, I think I ended up with that thing you were telling me about. Yes, because you're trying to open up a swap file, yeah. you're going to do that. So, 
So this time you're just going to do an edit anyway. Uh, so shift A takes you to the end of the thing and puts you in insert mode. I, I don't know what regular A does. A does the same thing. Oh, okay. Okay, then A does the same thing. No, I, I think they're the same, but I, I was not sure. Okay, so now we have these things in here. Then we made an algorithm. Why don't we just go ahead and do this? So one, we have put those guide posts directly into our program. And we have also started on documenting our code. So we can, this is not only saving time during the coding process. Afterwards, when we're putting in comments, some of them are already done for us. What you can also do is while you're in this section, you can make what's called a to-do flag. So when you're working on stuff, and you're like, oh, I'm going to have to come back to this because I don't feel like doing it right now. You type, as long as you're in some kind of comment mode, and you type to-do in full caps, it will highlight yellow. Okay. So let's go ahead and then right at the bottom, we're going to do that C out statement like he was saying. Okay, so here I'm gonna put several variable names in there. Some of them are on the long side. You can press down and hold N, control and then hit N and it'll tell you what is in scope right now. So then we can add the other stuff. It'll save a little bit of typing. Press and hold control, and then hit N. And that'll save you some typing. And then let's go ahead and we'll actually save these things to places. Now, this is not going to pass Uh, a Carla's type assignment. She doesn't like you doing just these naked requests. So make sure that you do this in a manner that Carla would like. But for observance of time, we're just going to do this stuff. We're, gonna, we're making CN statements without any kind of guards against the input. 
So we're 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 programming in a way that would make her hair turn gray if you turn this in like this. So this is just some boilerplate code that will run. And if I hear her mention my name in conjunction with look at this code, I will be very unhappy. So don't, I'm not teaching you this is the way to do perfect code to turn in. This is minimum viable product that will be turned into a functioning program at, at your leisure. Okay? Yeah? By a card, you mean like if we really wanted to make sure that it's actually a number and it's like not negative? And yeah, uh, also you'll, also she likes eating the, any other uh, miscellaneous input if you, because there's a lot of exploits you can run um, doing buffer overflow attacks and stuff like that. And she will have you do it the correct way, or, or at least the way she wants it done. Um, but you'll, in, you'll, you'll usually follow these CN statements with a CN.ignore, but that's, that's a whole other set. We're just gonna learn some basic programming and get this thing to run. Control N. Yep. Okay. I'm going to see if this will run. So now we're at a space where we think we have a running program. We haven't output boo yet. So we can actually make a whole new to do to do that. So I've now written all of this stuff there. I'm going to control Z to background it. And I'm going to go ahead and try to compile it. And we got a whole bunch of errors. Oh. Uh, just to save or to quit the file? Right. If you want to save it, then you should do colon WQ. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I do save it here, call colon WQ. Okay. But you can take the escape first. Oh, escape. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not doing WQ because I don't want to quit. But I am saving, so I just made this change because I have not done a C++ function in a while. So I actually forgot to put these things here to specify that yes, I, I do want this to be a function. Okay. So now I'm going to background the process and I'm going to try this again. Okay, so now I've got it to compile. Yes. So I'm um, G++ space and then the file to compile. Uh, how do you go out? Control Z. Control Z. Control Z. And then, and then FG brings you back in. So notice how my, when I leave that program and jump back in, the, it's not all the way up at the top like it would be if I was just right quitting and then jumping back in because it would always take me back here. But if you're in a program that is several lines long, it's much faster to background the process and background the process and then foreground the process. Especially during debugging when you're making a lot of really tiny changes and compiling stuff, it's it can take some time. And I want you to start thinking about all these little time-saving techniques. Okay? So that's everything there. Uh, oh, when it does this. So notice how I am actually typing in the middle of the terminal. You're going to see this happen sometimes. You can just type clear, or you can type control L. Does that delete anything, or hmm? it, just clears off? it just clears the screen. 
So I can still jump back in there, and then um, it's just there was there was too much stuff coming into it at once. Okay, so now I'm going to just jump to line 23 because now we're going to do this output of boo. So notice how I didn't mm. just go down a bunch. I actually told it I want to go down to line 23. Okay, so every time you do that, you need to, to explicitly go to that line. Don't try to go down. You want to go exactly where it told you. When it gives you an error, it'll give you a line number. Go ahead and just jump to that line number. The, the number? And then uh, you can do a capital G or you can do colon and then the number. It okay. just depends on how you want to do it. Yep. So if I want to go to 5, I can go to 5 and then shift G and it'll take me there. And then the same thing if I want to go to 24. And, and then for car like, we'll even put a return zero. Because she would have a heart attack if she saw that. <laughs> Some teachers really think that that's the most important thing you've ever seen, and then other people don't care. So pick up on what your teacher is saying this is important, and then uh, go ahead and make sure that that's important to you too. OK? Does anybody have questions what we did here? OK? What do you mean? Because like, you said that Carla doesn't like using the arrow keys. Yes. So is there a faster way to move around rather than like exiting out of insert and then doing that? Kind of no, you're going to just have to get faster at doing that. Okay. There are like one character substitution things that you can do, but they only will work for one character. You press one, it deletes one, or it adds one there, and then it runs, put, puts you back into command mode. Well, if the setting control is not working, I don't know, it just brings it. Is your caps locks on or something? No. I've not seen this happen before. Oh, oh okay, you were just in insert mode. That's why it was doing that. Oh, okay. how do you go to insert mode? Uh, so you were, so what you were is, um, see how insert is appearing here? Yeah. And then you hit Control-Z. Oh. So you just needed to be like that, and then you would back down the process. Oh. Okay. Okay. Okay, so these are some of the more important things you're going to want to do is learn how to copy and paste in here. So if you want to take an entire line, you hit YY, and that's, that'll yank that line and put it in the copy buffer. You can then take it somewhere and then hit P, and then you could paste that. If you want to do a whole function and move it around, you can go to visual mode. So you can actually hit uh, Shift V or Control V, and you can actually do a block. And then you can yank it and then paste it, OK? You can also just delete it, and then it'll still go into your copy buffer, and you can move it somewhere else. So that way you don't have two versions floating around, OK? You can also do a highlight and then paste from somewhere else. So if you go somewhere in like a web terminal, you might find some code that you want to look at and put it next to yours in order to have an example. You can actually co comment, c highlight it, put it in your copy buffer, and then you can hit Control and then right click into the terminal, and it'll actually copy into your terminal. Okay. 
O will actually go view a new line and throw you into insert mode. It's very useful when you go, you're, you're going to write a new function. You just hit O and then you just go. And you're going to, another thing is search. So you're going to search for a function. You just type backslash and then the word you're looking for. Okay. Find and replace will become a much more important when you want to replace a variable name or something. So you're going to hit a colon, percent %s to enter the search. And then you're going to put in the word you want it to find, and then a backslash, what you want to replace it with, and then a backslash gc. That stands for global confirm. So when it finds a string that matches, it will ask, do you want to replace this? And you can say yes or no. That becomes vital. It adds a little bit, of, it does add a few seconds, however, you're, it's not automatically going and changing your code in a way that it doesn't make sense. So if you make one mistake, you can have your entire program unusable. So always add the global confirm part. Also, one that thing that helps everybody is when your code becomes unreadable because of white space, GG equals capital G will fix your, well, it will do its best fix It'll guess what you're trying to do and auto format your white space for you. So if you're inside a function, it'll fix that. If you have an if, a chain of if statements and you've forgotten some of the, uh, the curly braces, this is a great way to do it because it will follow through your code and tell you what's going on. However, it's not 100% correct, but more often than not, it's because you're telling it to do something weird, okay? Anybody have questions on this? Does Carla have any problem with us using that? No, you can use all of these. These are, um, these are explicitly what she wants. Uh, GG equals G. Uh, the tutors will tell you to do that all the time when you've got squirrely looking code. And it's actually a really good debugging thing because if you have a function that wasn't closed correctly, you have some logical arguments that aren't doing the right thing, and you do this and you see your code look all squirrely, it's a good indicator that between where it looks normal and where it looks squirrely, there's something wrong. Usually your curly braces are doing something weird. Okay? When you're compiling, you've got a set of flags that you can use. One is, this, is uh, a wall flag. When you're debugging, you really don't care whether uh, you're getting your, your dot, uh, a dot out file you just wanted to, you're just saying, I want you to turn all warnings and treat them as errors, okay? So if you have a warning, more than likely there's something wrong with your output. So you might as well add a wall flag. Pedantic, that will actually increase the level of uh, the threshold of errors that it'll bring to your attention. So when you think you're completely done, you could throw this error or this flag in and say, all of these programs have a lot of history. Let's see what they have to say with what my code is. And they'll have some, some interesting things to point out. Slash G, when you want to debug your code using GDB, you need to compile with a G flag. In a couple weeks, we'll be going over how to use GDB, um, but that is a step you can take. When you are at your uh, proficiency demo, your code is completely broken and you are panicking. You will get points for merely compiling your code into a G flag and opening GDB. You might not know how to use anything, but we're gonna go over how to do it in a couple of weeks and you will at least show that you know how to do this so you'll get some points back, okay? I would definitely come into the habit of I'm stuck, at least play with that option, okay? Uh, hyphen O file name, when you're compiling it and you want something other than A dot out, you can do that. Okay. Does any have, anybody have questions on these? What does the pedantic do again? It gives it raises the threshold of what warnings you'll get. Okay. And how do you access those? I guess. So you're going to compile it, and then the files that you're going to do, and then the flags. I don't. We'll, we'll, we're we're going to do that right now. So you're, you're, 
so you're going to get a bunch of weird errors. Uh, we can actually make that the first one. So, because I, I haven't done this before, but if we do then, so, so one that we'll use occasionally, um, Okay. So notice instead of an a dot out, like I would usually get, I got a thing dot exe. Okay. Does that make sense on how, how that happened? So I said, hey, compiler, I want you to compile CPP. But instead of calling it a dot out, I want you to call it thing dot exe. And so it gave me thing dot exe. And that's the executable. OK? So we can go ahead and try to compile it with. Uh, oh. P. P. E. N. Well, let's. Let's see here. Pen. I think it's. Maybe it was a misspelled one. Uh, it could be. Is it that that one? Yeah. I mean, we can always hit ask the manual too if we. Yeah. I thought the dancing looked weird on there. Okay. So yeah. Um. But that's that's how you do the flags. I'm kind of surprised that that. All right. Let me go ahead and fix that so that's not a thing. OK. Does that make sense for everybody? Does anybody want to go over anything else? OK. OK. Now, look at this. If you think the coding's part hard, think about how hard the testing will be. Does anybody see a problem with that? What are you noticing? I'm just, I'm just at the, the yes, the thes are repeating themselves. Now, if some th an English simple statement like this is hard to pick out, imagine trying to go through thousands of lines of code and picking the one mistake out. This is why debugging is hard, because a simple letter or a simple character can destroy your entire program, and it's hard to pick these out. Eventually, you're going to be able to pay more attention to detail. You're going to have different tools at your disposal in order to find these little things that are just ruining your life. But it's hard. And I'm using this specific example for a reason. You, you're going to be under a lot of pressure and a lot of time constraints in order to write this code. But you're going to have to be careful, OK? Try to reuse as much as possible. If you know a function is working, don't, don't exactly match it. Call that function again and say, I want you to use different stuff. Uh, one of the main functions that I used is when I was coding, a lot of the Carla stuff, I would reuse the menu and then fix it so that it would have the number of options that I needed for that particular program. OK? You can also use input from another file. We're going to go th through this for testing. So. When you are first using this code, so we're going to run this program as the a dot out. So we're going to enter the number of creepy dolls, and I'm going to say one. And I want to enter the number of rocks, let's say two, and the slime stuff, we're going to say three. Oh, we did, forgot to output the boxes. Um,
Okay, so this was a great one with the flags. Uh, because I was using the wrong variable name. Okay. Okay, so did anybody else find that kind of repetitive? I had to open it up, open the program, run around. When you find yourself doing something more than once, there's a there you should ask yourself is there a better way oh i see what the problem is let me raise that window up a little bit okay so every time i wanted i would go into this program i would ask for a one it would ask for a two it would ask for a three let's open up another vim window and this one we're going to call test.text Okay, and if you noticed, I entered a one, I entered a two, and then I entered a three. Okay, now I'm going to run it again, but this time I'm going to tell Linux I want you to take one thing at a time and inject it into my program. Now, you don't see the stuff that I did. However, it ran through the entire program. So it entered the creepy dolls as one, it entered the number of rocks as two, it entered the number of uh, slime stuff as three, it then gave me boxes of six, and then it outputted boot. Okay? So you can work your program to bring that stuff back. You have, so you could say, enter the number of creepy dolls, and then you put, you entered one. Enter this, and put, give yourself plenty of white space. This is now, at a minimum viable product, of something you can turn in. It is giving, it is accepting input, it's giving you output, and it's saying boo. Okay? The rest is now something you can polish into something you can turn in. Okay? Yeah? What was the purpose of the text again? It, it was the source file in order to do this an, autonomously. So, so imagine you're going to have a program with a chain of if statements, a for loop that'll accept inputs, and it's going to create a linear length list of at least four different products, and then you need to delete one. You can manually type that all in, or you can create a text file once and have your program run remotely. Oh, so. Oh, right. mm -hmm. so, so you could actually tell it to stop at very specific stops. If I only put a one and a two in the text file, it would then stop for the third one and say, okay, what do you want me to do now? Oh, oh. So it makes the testing process, the debugging process of your program that much faster because I typed an extra three characters and hit tab and it entered three different things and then spit me out an answer. Does my program work? Is it correct? Because all I'm looking for is a six. And then out, and then redirected this to accept the input. Oh, so I did a vim test.txt and added one, enter, two, enter, three, enter. So if we did oh, this is all I did. It's entered one, enter, two, enter, three, enter. The same inputs that I manually entered, I put in this text file. Okay. So those are the values you put in. Mm -hmm. Those are the, so, so say, yeah. Instead of three, if you put nine or something. It's yeah, we can definitely put that. So let's, let's make this a three. And then a four. And then we write quit. So now we know that all of that number actually did add up to nine. 
Yeah. And I mean, we could, that's why I'm saying the next step would be to actually enter a new line character here and say you entered and then put in the, the creepy dolls variable. Oh, so wait, quick question. Yeah. How does the code connect the text, test dot te text with, with uh, this right here? Program? With this right here. So I compiled G++ main.cpp, and that gave me this a.out file. Uh, I then took that a.out file and ran it, but for every line that it asked for input, I gave it an input from test.txt. OK? Does that make sense? I know this is kind of tricky, but this is so perfect for debugging, it's not even funny. And the school never talks about this. I'm not lying when some of your programs are going to ask for 10, 20 different lines of text from a user. And they're going to actually ask for actual text, not a number. And this makes it automated. So yeah. If you're, if you're supposedly running 20 lines of inputs from the user, yeah. so in text you got to memorize it all? Right. No, you just just do this. Oh yeah. So but you're writing the program, and for you to test it, you're going to actually write test cases. Oh. So you're going to run through, and it's going to say, like uh, a, a good example is uh, you're writing a program, and it's asking for drones. That was that was the nightmare program that we had to do. Was we had to write a drone program, and it was a matrix of variable names. And you had to give information for each node, and you had to construct it. And then there was pointers that pointed to everything. It was a pain. And you had to do a lot of typing in order to get to the level where to even test it. So you could actually use this to create your, your program into a state where you could actually test stuff. So you enter 20 lines of stuff, and then you call your list function and make sure that that matches what you put in there. You would then add, check to make sure all the other stuff is working. Can you delete one? And then do another list. You can actually go into your program and say, this should be three. And then put a to-do flag and say, delete this line. How you do this is up to you, but I want to show you that this is an option. Because this will save hours of time later on. When you're writing your program and debugging your program, this will save you hours. And I'm not kidding when this is never brought up in any class. But it's very easy. Especially when you get to 163 and 202. Yes. Programs are really, takes a lot of input. And when you're trying to fix that one bug, yep. you got to keep you're going to type it again and again. Yeah, I wrote that drone program too. And yes. I read, read in a lot from a text file, but I had to implement reading yep. it from a text file. I wish I knew that. That's smart. Yeah. I didn't do that. I, I mean, <laughs> um, imagine being able to do that. And we're at a, at a few strokes of the keyboard. You have a fully functioning <laughs> matrix. But nobody talks about it. No. Nobody talks about it. And that, th that was one of the big reasons why I did these classes, is these things like this that will save hours of blood, sweat, and tears, but instead we're not, OK? Does anybody have any questions on this? Yeah. The other thing on the Carla logs list, make sure you don't submit a file without a header, because we yes. did not have a header. Yes. <laughs> this was not Carla at all. I did all of, so that, that, it, that actually had about 20 things wrong with it. I understand that. I'm sorry. I will personally ask for forgiveness from Carla if I ever get caught with this program. But I don't have this written down anywhere. It's just a fly-by-night thing so that you guys get experience of what kind of the thought process. And that's what I want to stress, is the thought process into the program, into doing stuff. But yeah, if she saw, if she saw that code as a turned-in thing, uh, she, would, she would instantly fail me and let all the other teachers know that I'm no longer fit for a computer science degree. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, could you uh, show me the, the main, the swap? Uh, yeah, sure. 
So right now, we have a main main.cpp file. So if I type jobs, we know that there is a currently a stop, uh, a stop job called vim, vim main.cpp, which is the command that was called. So if we type in ls, oh, actually ls hyphen a, because it's a hidden file, we're going to see right under main.cpp, it's swap file. Dot main dot cpp dot swap. Okay? And that's so if I try to call them again on I'm gonna get this error that says, Are you sure? You already have a swap file called Main, main that mm, that file we already saw, it's already there. This is a date and time stamp. Are you sure you want to do this? Okay. Oh, it even tells you, hey, it's already running. Where it's running at. So what what this prevents you from doing is opening up another Vim terminal and saving it, and then seeing this one without all the changes that you have been working on for about half an hour to an hour and saving this version over the one that has all your changes. Wait, so this is the one that you said, um, it's like the Microsoft Word where yes. it's uh, saving every time. Yes, but the implementation is slightly different. Okay. So that why if you, that's why when you see this, you should just go ahead and close it. Okay. Take this as a warning. You're going to type Q to quit. and then FG back there. And then that way you know you only have one copy that is being manipulated at a time. Because what happens is in Linux's file structure, it's called a last write wins. So let's say we're both working on something and we're sharing the file. I open it up and I wander off for an hour. And she is very diligent and works for the entire time I'm gone saves and close. And I come back and say, I don't feel like working on this. And I save and close. My version has overwritten her version. Because it's our version. And Linux is like that. So that's why when you see that, that's why when we're talking about swap files, why you have to be very careful and very deliberate on what you're going to do to treat them. Okay. We've, we've spent about an hour learning about these. Carla does not have time to teach students how to handle a swap file. And that's why you're going to see a lot of things that I bring to attention is stuff she can't touch because she just, she wants to teach you how to program. This is how to use a computer. Okay. okay? And so once you exit out of the, the swap file. Yes. Then so once we get out of this, yeah. Notice how under main.cpp there is no dot main.cpp dot swap anymore because we've actually closed it. And then if we type jobs again, we don't have anything running in the background. Okay. But yeah, none of this has to really do with how to program. This is all just, this is how Linux operates. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you, you guys have any questions or anything? Anything else? Uh, I just want to go back to the place, the text thing. The I text. Copy it down here. Oh yeah. So th that's all this is. Is you're just going to keep track of your inputs that you need for your program, and and then you're going to put them in a text document, and then you're going to redirect the input. Okay. So, oh, all right. um. so when you're, you're running through a program, you can have on a, on a separate piece of paper right next to you, they're going to say something like, enter a name. So you're going to be like, all right, so I'm going to need a name. You're going to need an address. And then you've put all of this in a loop. Do you want to continue? Then you'll put yes. 
And then you'll be like, OK, then I want to modify. So I'm going to need to actually type modify. And then you're going to have the, the things to modify. And then you're going to say, uh, do you want to exit? And you're going to say, or do you want to continue? And you're going to put no. All of those steps are going to go into that step by step. And then you're going to redirect the input. And then it's going to run through all of that in a split second and say yay or nay, that worked or not. Each corresponds to each input that you as a person would input. So what if you're like, to, I'm just wondering, like, if you're to put three and then enter, and then not put anything and then enter again? Yeah, it would just hang. It would just stop. Okay. And then it would ask for your next bit of input. So, wait, so would it like, it wouldn't go and skip to the two? Like, it doesn't see anything on the side? No, I mean, here, let's, let's go ahead and do it. We only have a three right there. Oh, so don't do that. Well, yeah. I know why it's doing that, and I am kind of surprised we're doing it. OK. Um, so make sure you exit the program using that stuff, and don't let it hang on that. Don't let it, OK. But I mean, like, if you have, like, three, and then enter, and then you don't put anything, and then you enter again, and then put two and four. It's going gonna, it's gonna to depend how your program operates on okay. that, OK? So when we were talking about different ways to do that, my program will fail. Okay. Don't let yours fail, yeah. OK? So G++ is for? That's compiling. compiling. So yeah, it's going to actually take your program and turn it into an exit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carlos spends a lot of time storytelling in her class. Yeah. yeah. It's an interesting setup. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so was it just dot slash a? So so what you're doing, what what you're you're actually doing is, G plus plus will automatically pull this dot this a dot out. This this file right here, it'll automatically produce it if you don't override it with that O flag we were talking about earlier. So, Linux has what's called a path. And your program from your home directory is not automatically mapped to a program to run. OK? So in order to tell Linux what you want to do, you're going to say, from here, I want you to run this program called a.out. So some people will modify their path to make it so they can run programs from their path so they don't have to put the dot slash. And then uh, they wonder why they have broken their computer. So don't, don't do it. Just, just do the dot slash. I am all for saving time. And I'm telling you, don't muck with your command line. I have, I have helped a lot of people fixing their path. If you absolutely have to, before you do that, come see me. And we'll, we'll figure out a way to mitigate this horrendous experience you're about to have. OK. Any other questions? OK. Let me make sure there was, there, that was everything. OK. Oh, some helpful links that we've got. DIA uh, for flowcharts. It's probably a little bit ahead of where you want, but I found it really handy when I had to take professional looking flowcharts. All those Vim keys, it takes a lot of practice. Vim Adventures is a free video game to play around and teaches you how to do Vim. Play that every day. It takes less than 10 minutes. It'll be faster the longer you play around with it. If you want to learn more about Git resources, you can go to this repo, type all of that. It's an open repo that you can clone in. And it used to be a basis, but it was about a two-hour long lecture and didn't teach a lot of what I went over today. So uh, if you want the whole smorgasbord, you can go into that. OK? And then if you come up with any other questions, you can always email me, or you can catch me around here. Okay.